Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you. Maybe you're Tony Glass. If you are, thank you. Peter Bohack, Philip Less, Christian Seneseth, all of you. Thank you. On this episode of DTNS, Google makes its new pixels official. Jason Howell will let you know what's notable about the announcements. Plus, The Verge outed a Valve game, and some people are very upset. And yay, our passwordless future is getting brighter. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, August 13th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I am Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. I don't feel like I really sold our passwordless future getting brighter. I sounded doubtful. Did you? <laughs> you sound doubtful. No, I'm doubting you. But Sarah, Sarah's going to tell us why the pass keys are going to save correct. us all. Correct, yeah. correct. It, it is, you know, it's, it, it, the future's so bright, we got to wear shades. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can unlock those shades without having to use a password. All right, let's <laughs> yeah. start with the quick hits. Chinese companies have been testing Huawei's Ascend 910C AI chip, which Huawei says is comparable to last year's NVIDIA H100. Because Chinese companies are restricted from buying NVIDIA's higher-end chips, demand is now high enough that Huawei may have to delay its October ship date target. A study looked at tablet use and temper tantrums in kids of 315 parents in Nova Scotia, Canada. The parents were asked to assess how often their children used tablets and fill out a behavior questionnaire, a standardized questionnaire that can assess child anger. The survey was taken when the children were three and a half in 2020, four and a half in 2021, and five and a half in 2022. Increased tablet use in 2020 was correlated with increased anger assessment in 2021, and that was correlated with increased tablet use in 2022. But this is lockdown era. So the study people kept said, keep that in mind. This this might be there might be other causes here as well. Yeah, well, tell that to my immediate neighbors. Canalyst defines an AI PC as one that includes a chipset or block for dedicated AI workloads, such as an NPU. Under that definition, AI PCs made up 14% of all PCs shipped last quarter, 60% of which ran Mac OS. Chip production in the U.S. is increasing, but there may not be enough workers to fill all the jobs. A McKinsey study estimated there will be a shortage of between 59,000 and 146,000 workers in the industry by 2029. A third of chip engineers are near retirement as well, so we're only going to lose more of them. McKinsey recommends that universities continue to develop training programs. Uh, companies reach out to other industries where workers might have some transferable skills, as well as immigrants and veterans willing to train on the job. Stratospheric balloon company Urban Sky is testing how its balloons can help monitor wildfires in Colorado using sensors and long-wave infrared cameras that can transfer data to ground crews. Balloons have an obvious advantage over satellites and drones because they're cheaper to operate. They can also fly in the stratosphere where there's almost no other air traffic. The Verge's Sean Hollister, just on the show yesterday, <laughs> and uh, after that, uh, he published a little story that has caused quite a stir. Uh, Sean got an email invite to try Valve's unannounced game called Deadlock. Now, the email invite itself didn't have any limits. It didn't say what he could talk about or what he couldn't. Uh, Sean described it in his Verge article as Overwatch with elements of Dota 2. Uh, and he did note, in fact, included a screenshot of a pop up that said early development build deadlock is still early in development with a lot of temporary art and experimental gameplay. Do not share anything about the game with anyone. However, Sean Hollister did not press OK, agreeing to that. He pressed escape and then it went away. So he wasn't prevented from playing the game after seeing the pop-up, and he didn't technically agree to it. He then published a story with descriptions of the gameplay and screenshots, and after that story went live, was banned from matchmaking mode. He can still play it on his own, but he can't go play with others. And Gadget notes that SteamDB estimates there are around 16,000 people playing this game uh, who have been invited to try Deadlock. Now, Valve has made no public statements as of this recording about either the game or the Verge article. But some Valve fans are mad at Hollister uh, and The Verge uh, for publishing this when Valve asked them not to. 
Sarah, you know, from the journalistic point of view, what do you think? Should should they have done this? I think it, you know, The Verge's uh, publication, I respect greatly. Uh, I, I also think that I can understand where someone would be like, this is essentially a spoiler that I didn't ask for. I know it's mm-hmm. not exactly the same thing as a TV or movie spoiler, but it's sort of like, you know the game's not finished. You're showing us stuff. It's either spoilery or, or you know, it might even just not be accurate as far as what game we're going to play later. So, you know, you suck for ruining everyone's fun. And also... Uh, it, uh, they Valve asked you nicely not to do this. Well, mm-hmm. it wasn't an NDA. It wasn't an embargo. They didn't prevent The Verge or Sean Hollister from playing the game. You know, if you, if you if you get a pop up that says, "Hey, you need to agree to this," and there's some legal implications, and you don't agree, well, don't let them play the game then. Now, I I that's that's kind of where I stand on this. I also think that. Y- <laughs> You're being maybe a little like pushy in the sense of like being first rather than yeah. being kind. But again, you know, if we're talking honor system, I think things need to be a little bit more cut and dry. Yeah, I, I I agree with you. Being first versus being kind, and it depends on what perspective you take on this. What my, in my own mind, what decision I come to from the journalistic perspective. And I, I know this isn't like, you know, people are going to die if they don't publish it. But from the journalistic perspective, uh, if you get access to something that is of interest to your audience and important to it, you report on it. And you shouldn't be beholden to companies not to report, right? That That is how you right. get uh, access journalism causing problems where they can later say, well, we don't want you to say this. So from a journalistic perspective, I 100% support this. You should be able to say whatever you want as long as you're not violating an agreement. And he's not. On the other hand, from the community perspective, from the like, I'm a fan and I like the games perspective, it isn't kind. And sometimes journalism isn't kind, but it isn't being a good community member to do this. At Valve asked nicely, hey, please don't share this. And if a community member had gone and leaked it on Reddit or something, people would be flaming that person. uh, And and rightly so. Right. Because they're being a bad community member. Uh, Right. So. Well, and if that had happened and The Verge said, hey, so and so on Reddit leaked all these screenshots, all of a sudden nobody's mad at The Verge because The Verge is just like it's out there and we're passing it along because we're a news. That happens all the time. Right. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Uh, So I don't know. I look at this and I think maybe in hindsight, hindsight's 2020. Also, I I should make sure people know that Sean, Sean is my brother-in-law. He's married to my wife's sister. So don't believe anything I say about it. But uh, (laughs) I think that they probably should have toned it down. They probably should have said, hey, we got invited into this game. Maybe don't do the screenshots. Maybe uh, maybe just say, like, we got into this game and we didn't have, we, were, we were able to play it without agreeing to anything uh, and soft pedal the story a little. That's what I say now, though. I probably would have said the exact same thing The Verge editors said to Sean beforehand because it's too juicy of a story not to. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd venture a guess that the folks that enjoyed a sneak peek into a game that they're eagerly anticipating probably outweighs the, you know, the, I don't know, the, 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 the small number of folks, not even including the 16,000 people who have access, who were upset about this. Yeah. Yeah. Probably I mean, it, I get it. This is it, not it, the Pentagon minority. papers or WikiLeaks or something level yeah. stuff, but, but still, you know, that's, that is yeah. how journalism works. Uh, let's move on to good news about our passwordless future that I promised, Sarah. Tell us the good news. Well, the the bad news is that we're not quite there yet, but we're getting mm. closer all the time. Password manager Dashlane shared uh, its first passkey report, never did one before, covering which websites and services are driving passkey adoption the most as the more secure option over passwords. Based on hundreds of thousands of anonymized passkey authentications over the past year that Dashlane looked at, so-called sticky uh, consumer apps that people use the most often, daily or weekly basis, are the passkey leaders. Amazon is in first place, 89% growth over the past three months. Then you've got Target, 
bookkeep, bookkeeping service Moneybird, eBay, and Adobe, all others in the top five of uh, their users who are using passkeys. Dashlane notes that some of the results tend to skew when users authenticate through Apple and Google, since in those cases, they're less likely to use a third-party service. Um, so that's why neither Google or Apple are in the top five. And Dashlane reports that its own passkey usage, because it's a password manager, is up 400% since the start of this year, with one in five active Dashlane users having at least one passkey that's stored in their vault. And we know all of you know the difference between passkeys and passwords. But, you know, a, a good way to explain it to somebody that you know and love and don't want their password stolen is, you know, fingerprints, facial recognition, a PIN number, QR code that, you know, you can use to share a passkey between two devices. All great options over passwords. Password managers are also great, uh, but uh, passkeys can can make your life easier, honestly, as long as as long as you understand which services are using them and the fact that you can't reuse a passkey. It's only, you know, my Amazon passkey, for example. I can't reuse that anywhere. It's not my mother's birthday. It doesn't work that way. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a handshake agreement between your local device and a server somewhere where the server does not know your personal information. We have a whole episode to know a little more about this. Uh, go check it out, knowalittlemore.com. I've got a chapter in Synced about this as well. Passkeys are ready. They are secure. They are way better than passwords. Uh, I highly encourage everyone to adopt it. Uh, I do agree that we're not ready to just use passkeys. I understand why there's a password backup and other backups uh, to, to logging in. But the more people who adopt and say yes to passkey, the better. So I am encouraged by this report that the growth is what it is. Also, I didn't know Moneybird was all that popular. Like, that's that's interesting. I know. Well. That was kind of a I, side note I actually there. had to look it up because I didn't know what Moneybird did. Uh, they do bookkeeping. Keep, and The new Quicken. <laughs> they 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 have a lot of secure users, so good on you, money birders. Well, if you have a thought about anything we talk about on the show, past keys or otherwise, send it our way. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Faithful's Jason Howell was at the Made by Google event in Mountain View, California, and took time out of that hectic schedule uh, to talk to us. Jason, thank you, man. It's good to see you. Yeah, thank you. This is a lot of fun. I've never actually been, like, I've covered a lot of, of Google hardware, like, legit. Oh, hey, there's there's Ron Richards. Hey, Ron Henry Richards. Faithful's Ron Richards coming into shot. Um, I've covered a lot of these events from afar. I've never actually been to their Pixel hardware event in person. So it's been uh, it's been cool to kind of get the other side of the glass experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's let's run through. Uh, we got three new Pixel 9s. We actually yeah. have four 9s if you count the Fold. But let's not talk about the Fold. Uh, the okay. 9 the 9 Pro and the 9 Pro XL. So we have two yeah. sizes uh, of the Pro. Uh, tell us a little bit about those. Yeah, so I mean, you know, and, and by the way, I do have the 9 in my hand, which I can, you know, do the device showcase Ooh, in my in my hands. It, it, and it looks like a pretty solid device. I'm really excited to put it uh, through its uh, paces. Um, really, I think largely what Google has been talking about the last couple of years when it comes to these devices, and especially this year, it's all AI. You know, every everything is really directed at what can this device do for you that maybe we had promised before, but now we can actually deliver because it's got a Tensor G4 chip in it. It's got Gemini on device. It's got that Gemini Nano. So now with the with the nine series, you can do multimodal um, processing and everything. All of it designed to, you know, hopefully make the phone more useful on a regular basis, get more people using AI instead of it being this funny, you know, little thing that when you think about it, it might, you know, write a short paragraph for you. Now it's like its tendrils are, are interwebbing through all of their devices on a deep level because of that Tensor G4 chip in there really kind of supercharging things. Yeah. And, and you get more RAM, <laughs> which is, exactly. you know, because you're going to need it with all of that AI, right? You are. Yeah, the 9 gets 12 gigs, and then the 9 Pro and 9 Pro XL get 16 gigs, which is a large amount of RAM, especially for Google. We're seeing that. We've been seeing you know those large RAM sizes on other devices for a while. I feel like Google's always kind of a, a step or two behind in previous Pixels as far as that's concerned. Now they're really stepping up, and they need to because AI is very thirsty. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and there's less differentiation, it feels like. Uh, the 9 and the 9 Pro look the same. They just differ mm -hmm. in specs. And then the, the Pro XL is the same specs as the Pro. It's same. just a bigger display, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You do get, um, you know, some upgrades like the display technology, the Actua on the 9 versus the Pro and XL getting super Actua. So you're getting a little bit, you know, more uh, sharper, brighter, that sort of stuff. Um, you're getting a vapor chamber on the phone. So... Uh, which just sounds cool. It sounds like a synthwave band or something. But um, it's, uh, you know, essentially it's going to mean that you can do better kind of lower um, heat impacted gaming, you know, higher performance gaming isn't going to tax the device. And Pixels in the past have had some kind of hot to the touch issues. So hopefully the vapor chamber addresses that. But yeah, the phones look look pretty solid. Yeah. Yeah. Um add me was kind of a fun one where you can take two yeah. group shots and add yourself uh that was that your favorite or, or was there another one of these new features like reimagine or panorama with night sight or something i mean honestly there's so many that they announced right like call notes which is like a transcription mm -hmm. of the call on device and then um and then you actually have the notes after the fact taken for you for me that's going to be incredibly useful like when they're announcing that i'm like okay that i know i'm going to want to use um yeah, um, Admi is neat. That's that's the uh, the camera technology that allows you, if you're taking a big group shot, save some space in the shot, take the photo, and then it does an overlay of the photo that you just took, which allows you to kind of swap camera uh, partners with someone and go into that space, and then it superimposes you with the magic of AI, blah de blah And it looked really good in the onstage demos. That's cool. Pixel Studio, which is essentially image generation on the device. Um, so, you know, it's, it's like mid-journey, but in your pocket, uh, delivered by Google, and I imagine that's tapping into their premium subscription in order to do that and which by the way if you buy any of these phones you get a year of their premium subscription which includes all of that ai magic because they know once you start <laughs> using it you're going to be more likely to want to have to re-up especially because they also give you larger amount of storage space i think it's something like two terabytes so it yeah, locks yeah. you in man and it, yeah, won't yeah, let yeah. You, it won't let you go <laughs> or make you want to buy the new phone so you get another yeah, deal down exactly. the road oh that's true that's a good yeah. point 6.3 inch Pixel 9 starts at $799. That's $100 more than last year's model. Uh, the same size Pro 999, 6.8 inch Pro XL, $1,099, all shipping mm. August 22nd. None of them with Android 15. They'll get those later. Let's right. talk about the Pro Fold. Uh, this is the second version of a foldable for, for Google. What'd you think? Yeah, no, I am super, like, I haven't had a chance yet to go into the demo pit and kind of get my hands on the fold. But um, I think it's a really, you know, dare I say, sexy looking device. I think they've they've played around a little bit with the aspect ratio uh, when it's unfolded uh, to make it, uh, you know, to just bring it a little bit more in line with what you expect out of kind of a wider screen experience. Mm -hmm. I think it looks solid. And, and I think what's, what's also really cool here is often with foldables uh, i think this is the year where this is changing but often with foldables you take a step down on the ladder as far as kind of the specs that are driving it and this seems to be the year where they're saying eh, just because you're on a foldable which is cutting edge doesn't mean you have to take your step down on the ladder and this this phone is kind of a big example of that too i'm really excited about it i like that it's more square when it's unfolded mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but I actually like the folded version of last time. And so the fact that yeah. it's, it has to be a little taller to get there uh, for me, maybe not, not that great, but uh, no, I, I would completely agree with that. I mean, you know, the, the worst example of this is the Z fold series. I hear that the current Z fold has addressed this a little bit more, but it's still, in my opinion, a little too narrow to be, you know, like a similar, like similar to a, a standard phone that you'd have in your hands. The pixel fold from what little use I got out of the previous version seemed to address that on the cover. I hope that the cover is as useful yeah. and I imagine it's going to be better than what we get out of the Z fold. Even even, even this year. So. I would imagine so too. Uh, eight inch inner screen, 6.3 inch outer, 4,650 milliamp hour battery for those who care. $1,799 though. Boom. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, it isn't cheap, but at least they didn't boost the price. They, didn't they did it. boost the price on the other phones. So, yeah, yeah. you know, they decided now, you know what, we've hit the upper limit on the full. We got to keep it here. And I think that was a good move. And that one's shipping September 4th. Uh, let's talk about a couple other things uh, real quick before we let you go. Pixel Watch 3, two new sizes, or a new size, two sizes. There's a bigger size, right? Right. 
Yeah, well, they always had the smaller size, the 41 millimeter. Now they've got the new 45 millimeter. So, you know, my wife was was using the Pixel Watch too because I've been letting her use the the one that I have uh, recently for fitness and stuff. And she was like, oh, new Pixel Watches. Are they coming out with a smaller one? I'm like, uh, I hate to disappoint you. They're coming out with a larger <laughs> one. So, you know, maybe next year they have three. But I mean, these watches... You know, yes, they have that that design, which I really do think that the Pixel Watch design is very beautiful and very elegant, rounded. It just it just feels kind of premium when you have it on your wrist. But they're really leaning into, you know, once again, the AI um, aspects of a lot of this as relates to fitness and, you know, that that relationship with Fitbit and everything, the relationship being Google owns Fitbit, but the fact that they're really sharing their IP between those brands, really mm. boosting the capabilities of the of the Pixel Watch to do a lot of these extra things like planning your workout for you, you know, being a being a coach that's in your ear. Um, you know, these things that like as promises sound really neat. Really what it comes down to is in action, how do they deliver? And that's what I'm really curious about. There. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the pulse detection seems to be getting a lot of buzz uh, well, as well. Yeah. And that was something that, um, you know, I, I didn't hear anything about. So if there was a surprise from the event and, you know, I was looking around when that was being demonstrated, asking other people were like, yeah, I hadn't heard about that. That seemed to be a, a legitimate surprise that came out of nowhere and could be a really big deal. Um, you know, because it's not just pulse. Cause like when you see that, you're like, oh, what? So it's not, you know, is it going to have a lot of misfires? Cause it, it's not landing correctly. And it's like all these different sensors together along with your pulse to determine, is there a loss of pulse event? Do we need to call 911 for you immediately and get you help? Yeah. Uh, 16% smaller bezels. Watch 2 starts at $349, ship in September 10th. And then the Pixel Buds Pro 2, mm. I, I don't know if you have much to say. They're a little smaller and they have the Tensor A1 chip in them. Yeah, Tensor A1. And so they say, you know, it's kind of like the first Pixel Buds with Gemini uh, capability built in because of that A1 chip. Um, and I'm assuming that Gemini Live uh, interaction is streaming from the phone. That's an assumption. I haven't played around with it personally. But, you know, you tap, you hold, and you say, let's talk live. And then you start to have a conversation with it and ask it things. And, you know, it's that whole idea of, of that AI assistant being there to you know, for you to bounce ideas off of or ask a uh, an ongoing question. Essentially, this Gemini Live seems to be a really big deal launching with the phones. Also here launching with the Pixel Buds Pro 2, or sorry, uh, 3. I keep saying, is it 2 or 3? I'm getting it's the name. Two. It's, it's 2. It's 2, okay. Yeah, yeah. Everything, okay, that's You right. made me wonder, think okay. for a second. Yeah, too. yeah apologies yeah. about that. But yeah, this, no is, this is legitimately like the next phase of the Pixel Buds, not just, you know, dumb uh, noise cancellation headphones in your ear, but also really meant to kind of lean into what Google is doing on a holistic sense around their AI yeah. strategy. I mean, you you could just connect any buds to a phone and access Gemini, but this this reduces latency and makes it smoother right. and uh, and all that sort of stuff. I think that's, Two, that's a big deal. Yeah. $229 coming September 26th. Uh, before we let you go and get back to it, any any yeah. last thoughts? Did you get to see Kiki Palmer or Jimmy Butler or anything? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I saw them in the room. Yeah. I will admit a couple of those names. I was like, uh, who is that again? Um, I know Mark Rober. Um, anyways, yeah, I think my final thought is when they uh, – ended the event, Rick Osterlow started talking about where AI is leading us and everything. Talked about Project Astro, which got a ton of buzz at Google I.O., coming first to Gemini. So that's kind of a hint that Astra is, you know, uh, on the roadmap to some degree coming to Gemini on phones uh, in the hopefully the near future. But then also really kind of pointing out the advanced research capabilities of what uh, Google is working with around its AI, not just being able to pull down these these websites, but really kind of follow the directory trees to really find the information and go deeper and deeper. And, uh, you know, AI is really great for research, and that, that's the kind of stuff that could be incredibly useful, given it's polished, given it's accurate, and uh, I'm excited to see where that leads. Yeah, a lot of givens, a lot of givens to be seen, but but uh, but promise. Always. Yeah, another promising one. Uh, <laughs> Always. <laughs> folks, if you, if you haven't subscribed to Android Faithful yet, go do that, androidfaithful.com. And while you're there, you can read about all these devices in more detail. Michal and Ron and Jason and Wen have been writing a lot of good stuff over there. Go check that out. Jason, thank you so much for taking the time, man. Appreciate it. 
All right, Sarah, All right. Let's, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. If you like to challenge yourself to visit new places, perhaps you're just a competitive person. You want to see new things. Chris Christensen has the perfect website for you. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. If you are well-traveled and competitive and a country counter, then a site for you would be Most Traveled People or MTP.travel. This is a site that makes it real easy for you to keep track of not just what countries you've been to or what UN recognized countries, but also divides the world into 1,500 different regions. You can see how much you have seen and also can see what other people have seen You can also keep track of what World Heritage sites you've been to, what beaches, golf courses, dive sites, etc. But the country counting, I think, is what makes it very interesting and the maps that you can automatically generate from that. The site, again, is mtp.travel. And this is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. That's fun. I like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. did did you ever do that on Google Maps? They had a feature that was kind of similar to that at one point. No, no. Uh, in fact, Google Maps keeps uh, reminding me, like, do you want to save your timeline of everywhere you've ever been? <laughs> <laughs> I get that email once a week, and I keep saying, oh, yeah, I got to do that. I yeah, actually kind of like that, that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, even if you're just, even if you're just breadcrumbs for yourself, I think it's, I, I like that stuff. We also got an email from RTJ in Brisbane, Australia, who had a tip for Sony's PSVR 2 controller issue that we talked about with Sean Hollister yesterday. Uh, RTJ says, I successfully connected the PSVR 2 to my NVIDIA Quadro RTX 4000 without an adapter, thanks to the virtual link interface. I did encounter some setup issues with the controllers. If your system has onboard Bluetooth and you're using an external adapter, like the TP-Link UB500, be sure to disable the motherboard's bluetooth in the bios without eye tracking and foveated rendering i'd say the psvr2 is on par with my hp reverb g2 both deliver a similarly immersive high quality experience in half-life alex as for a vr killer app horizon call of the mountain on the ps5 stands out for its use of eye tracking and foveated rendering it would be fantastic if it were ported to pc just like horizon forbidden west was earlier this year uh thanks for the thoughts on that rtj and especially for the tip about disabling the bio so i'm gonna pass that along to sean as well yeah, thank you to everybody who sends us email feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Also, thanks to Jason Howell. Uh, he, you can tell he was excited, you know, boots on the ground. On the Those ground, are fun. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and a reminder, androidfaithful.com is where that team is going to have a big old roundup of the Made by Google event on their next episode, and it's a good show in general. You should check it out there. Uh, If you want to supplement your daily tech news with a weekly deep dive on all things Apple, in our latest episode of Apple Vision Show, Eileen Rivera and I revisit the pros and cons of an Apple One subscription. I had kind of forgotten about it. We talk about a lot of other stuff, too. Join us at applevisionshow.com. Patrons, stick around for the extended show. You get more on Good Day Internet. We're going to be talking with Pixel user Roger Chang. That's right. Our producer Roger uses a Pixel. Has Google swayed him to upgrade? Stick around and find out. You can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2000 UTC. And, of course, you can always find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow with Scott Johnson joining us, and I have a feeling it's going to be another good show in tech news. We'll talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs) 